So all of this, things I enjoyed, I'm making six figures, I'm stacking my cash, I bought what I thought was my dream home, all of these things. And then my husband at the time was like, hey, I had no job, I had no money, I had no network, and I was starting my business. You're listening to the Build Your Vision podcast, a podcast series about maneuvering the ups and downs of building a life that you're proud of, captured in real time. A community where dreamers become doers and doers become world changers. Let's go. Yo, what's up, what's up? This is the Build Your Vision podcast, the number one self-leadership podcast for young visionaries who are serious, not just curious, about building a life in business they are proud of. What's up, I'm Clee the Visionary. I'm your self-leadership coach, and it is my mission to help lead you on the journey of becoming a visionpreneur. So that's a term we came up with all up on our own over here in the BYV community. It's an individual who makes impact and income with their ideas, insights, and influence because someone needs what you are building, y'all. A vision can be a lot of things, right? Inspiring, motivating, freeing, but structured? Uh, That's usually not one of them, right? That's kind of scary to think about, right? Especially when you're used to, you know, operating in a system of structure, whether that's school, whether that's being in an internship, whether that's being an employee, whatever it is, things can get uncomfortable real quick when the only thing separating you from being broke, busted, and disgusted is how well your daily decisions can turn your vision into reality for your life. Have you ever found yourself hesitant about taking that leap into your vision, leaving that structure that you're accustomed to? I know I have, and I know lots of people have said they have been. So what we're going to talk about today is something that you definitely want to pay attention to if you have ever found yourself in this predicament. I brought Dr. Crystal Cunningham on the show today, and she shares how she went from being a pharmacist, making six figures, having the dream home, the dream life, living where she wanted to live, all this stuff, right, that was going right. And then out of nowhere, she's a new business owner. She's living in a new city. She has a whole entirely new life and with like the span of 12 months. It's a great story. I'm excited to share this conversation with you because I think you can learn a lot from her experience, but also just be inspired that you are not alone in this vision building journey. Take out your pen and paper. We're about to get into it. Let's go. What is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? It is the life experience I gathered from being in college from being a pharmacist, and that is rough, rough. Again, uh, Zoom stars. <laughs> when anybody that goes into anything medical, I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Zero stars would not recommend, but no, I enjoyed my, my tenure, even though it's not over as a pharmacist. I enjoyed my time in college, but I feel like that was an amazing space in my life where I had a little bit of freedom to explore, to better understand myself, to make connections, push myself, to realize it was okay not to have everything together. And so I think the investment in myself to be committed to college, to be committed to doing a residency, to be committed to being a pharmacist for about 17 years and counting, I think that has been the best investment because it set the stage and the foundation for who I am. What made you pursue that route in the first place? Okay, so I always knew, like I love science, I love math, I love healthcare. I did not want to be a nurse. I did not want to be a physician. And then I learned that pharmacists are actually the heartbeat of healthcare, like the lifeline, like no real health system could operate efficiently or effectively if they did not have us. And it's not just about giving pills. It's not just about creating a formulary, but we are that safety net. If you wrote something and your decimal point is off, we catch it. If you aren't exactly sure how to dose a medication, we catch it. And what you can do as a pharmacist is like, Amazing. I know most people only think of like retail, Walgreens, CVS, never done it. I worked in a hospital, but even then there's like nuclear pharmacy. There is a medical science liaison. There is research and 
all of this stuff that you can do as a pharmacist, my nerd is showing, but there's so much stuff that you can do as a pharmacist and it really is amazing. And I had an older cousin who was actually a pharmacist. Now she worked in a retail setting and I thought that was just super amazing to see her in her white coat in the back, talking to patients, helping them, doing all the, these things. And so I said, you know what? When I get older, that is what I want to do. And I did it. I do wish I would have explored more avenues in pharmacy, but now I'm creating my own lane because I can use my pharmaceutical background in the area of my current business. So so how did that happen, right? Because now you are an entrepreneur. So you went from something in when I was in school, right? You know, you had these biology major, mm -hmm. majors that were going to go to med school or do pharmacy school. Or I had friends that are in all those spaces. And I used to kind of envy them because I'm like, man, your whole track is like playing for you. Like you just, you go from here to here to here. I'm over here like, bro, I don't know what I'm about to do tomorrow. Okay. I always like kind of wanted that, which is kind of like, the, I think maybe some of the reason why I created what I created with Build Your Vision. Cause I'm like, there's not really a, a framework for people that don't fall within you know, lots of these traditional routes. But when it comes for you, like you're going from a traditional, more traditional route where it's like, this is the road to get to the destination that you want to be to one that is very much unpaven, you know, and never done before. So what was the transition and why did you choose to take this route after going to become a pharmacist for so long and all the hard work you put in? I will say the transition was probably rough, but I created my business essentially out of necessity. So I had lived in a certain area for about 12 years. I relocated to another area. And although pharmacy is amazing and we do amazing things, when you have the amount of experience and training, some people just want to hold on to their dollars. And so I either couldn't find a job that wanted to pay me what I felt I was worth, or there just weren't any jobs available. And so after some time of looking for employment and in the interim, I was actually going through my own natural transition. Every time I would talk to my friends, it would be about natural hair care because they were natural as well. I was telling them what they should do. And they were like, why don't you just start a business? And I was like, eh, that's funny. And then I was like, you know what? That's a pretty good idea. It's not like I got anything to do right now. So I took everything that I had learned on my journey becoming natural and actually being comfortable with my natural hair. And I looked at what was missing, what was lacking, what I felt was needed. And then I put all of that into Bolt Culture Beauty. And that is essentially how I got there. Then oddly enough, once I created the business, then I got a job, but I realized I could do pharmacy well. At that point, it came relatively easy to me, but I couldn't do business well going to work full time and then coming home trying to do what I was trying to do. And so I decided to just go full time after about a year of being back in work. I decided just to go full time in my business. And here I am. Yeah. And this is just a weird question. But like when it comes to hair care and other mm -hmm. hair products, like are you doing that? Or are you just outsourcing or like having stuff? sent to your uh, retail location? Like, are you actually making products? Like, because you have a pharmaceutical background? Like, how, how I don't know anything. I'm, how does that work? So I am not currently actively making products. But what I do in my business is curate a list of products that are available at my store that are beneficial when it comes to actually being able to properly care for your hair. So I look at the ingredients, I look at their effectiveness. I've even used a large portion of them. And then based on what you're trying to achieve and the effectiveness of the product, the usefulness of the product, then I will add those products to my store. So it does go through like a secondary vetting process that I um, actually do myself, which is me taking the time to look at what's in it, taking the time to see how it works in a lot of situations, using it on myself. Before I say, yes, this is a solid product, it will be more beneficial than harmful to you on your natural journey in your pursuit of cultivating an environment where your hair thrives. And so I support it. I'm going to put it in my store. OK, so and please, I, I'm not trying to um, downgrade what you do or like any. I'm just trying to like assimilate. I'm trying to and make sure the listener understands what's going on here. So I'm going to put it in words like my 
my listenership skews young. So mm-hmm. you're basically like a physical retail influencer. Like you find the products and then like you bet them, you make them available to your audience basically, and they could buy it in your store. That is correct. So like from a business standpoint, how, what is the margin on that? Cause you got to get the products sent to you. Mm-hmm. you like you mark them up or like how, how's that work? I do mark them up. So I'll say this. When it comes to the description you gave, the difference is I am not an influencer with an influencer contract from any right. of these businesses. Right, right, right. And so from a business perspective, I had to go through the process of beco- becoming an incorporated business, getting a wholesaler's license. That means now that I'm able to go to these businesses and say, hey, I'm an actual living, breathing business. I do business in Florida. I would like to carry your products in my store. And they say, great, let me, well, some of them say, great, let me see your tax ID, send them that, show them I'm a real business. And then I buy them at a discounted or wholesale rate. And then I'm able to put them in my store. And the markup really just depends on who you get it from. Cause some wholesalers will, will refer you to their third party wholesaler that, um, handles all of that work and some of them will let you buy them directly from them. When you go to that third party, there's usually a markup for them. And then, so that kind of affects how much you can mark it up. So you might have like 40% margins. If you go to the actual business, then they may give it to you at a larger discount. So you could have like 50% margin. Actually having people come out to your store from those businesses to help you host in-store events. And so that creates an amazing opportunity for you to build traction as a business and you to get repeat customers and for them to refer customers to you. And that, on top of the margin, is a strategy of mm-hmm. success. So, Got you. Yeah, and that gets into the strategy of how, you know, you make yeah. your leverage in your business. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, I think we got a lot, enough information now, but here's the thing. There's some yes. holes in this story. So, like, you start out, Around, you're a Florida girl, right? You went to school. Mm-hmm. Uh, thankfully, you were able to get a scholarship. You wanted to be a pharmacist. You made that decision. You accomplished the goal, even though it was very hard, but you were very smart. And you were mm-hmm. very resilient. And you were very determined. Then uh, you it, you worked in a hospital. I don't know if that was the only place mm-hmm. you worked. We were without a job at some point. You moved. Mm-hmm. And you kept getting people telling you, well, you need to do this hair care thing because you always have been doing hair care. And you had gone natural at that point. And you were given tips anyways. You're like, let me turn it into a business. Somewhat out of necessity because you weren't doing anything anyway. Right. Okay. Why did you move? And why did you have a job? <laughs> I'm, 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 all, I'm all up in your business, but I just like, I'm trying to make sense. Like, because I'd be listening to some interviews, some podcasts. And I'm like, wait, how? And I just be leaving, I just be leaving the interview with so many questions. Like, how they get, how they have, how can I do that? Because I can't see how they did it, like type of thing. So I just want to fill it. Okay. So I will say I started, I was very fortunate that when I did my residency, I was able to stay on at the hospital that I did my residency at. And so I did not work anywhere else. I worked at, I graduated. I did a residency at St. Vincent's Medical Center in Jacksonville, Florida. I stayed there after I completed my residency and I was even, I guess, promoted to the position of team leader for the operating room pharmacy department. And that's where I was for 12 years. A good job with good pay. You got to increase every year as long as you did what you're supposed to. They had this wellness situation where they were paying for me to like, I really enjoy Pilates and some other things. Part of their benefits pay for you to do these kind of things so that, I mean, your healthcare system, we want our employees to be well. So So all of this, things I enjoyed, I'm making six figures, I'm stacking my cash, I bought what I thought was my dream home, all of these things. And then my husband at the time was like, hey, remember when I applied for that job a few months ago? Well, almost a year ago. They say yes, and it's in Orlando. So that meant I willingly gave up all of those things and packed up my two babies, our family, And we moved to Orlando to start this new amazing journey as a family. And then a year after we got here, well, so that's why I didn't have a job. And then in the interim, when I didn't have a job, 
a year after we moved there, I didn't have a husband. <laughs> and so I needed a job and a business. I started the business while we were still married and I didn't have a job. I didn't get a job, though, until I was no longer married, which I think was divinely orchestrated because it turned out that a person that I had been a preceptor for that had been a classmate of mine, like I taught them, they saw that I I didn't know that they were the director of pharmacy at their hospital, but I saw that they were hiring somebody, PRN. At that time, I didn't want to be working super full time because I was splitting custody. So I wanted to be available for my children. But then when they weren't there, be able to go to work. And so this person was like, I saw your name. I knew you would be great. You were my teacher. And so I got hired. So I did that for about a year. And then I was like, eh. the drive was long. It was taking away from me being able to invest the full amount of time and attention that I wanted. So I was like, this was great. That person had moved up, so they weren't there anymore. And so I said, I'm just going to work my business. Yeah. And that's going to lead us into the next full question. And we kind of talked about it a little before we mm -hmm. got on camera, right? But when did it happen for you, the switch where your passion changed? Because in order for you to make the decision that you made, you had to value what you were building more than what was already built. So when did that happen for you? So I don't know if my passion completely changed. The desire has always been to help people be well, to help people be whole. Through my personal journey of transitioning to natural hair care, I understood and realized how important our identity was, and then most specifically, our hair was when it came to actually being well and being whole, when it came to stepping into rooms and feeling like you belong there, stepping into rooms and and being your full self, self stepping into rooms and not shying back because you were carrying this insecurity about how you looked um, and about your hair. And so because that was a burden that I carried, because that was a burden that I also realized dictates if you're ever able to accomplish any of the other goals that you set for yourself, I then made it my mission to make sure that no other person or girlfriend, as I called them, had to carry that burden or that weight by themselves or even at all. Because now I know what to do and now I know better. And so I'm going to be committed to paying it forward and to helping those people who desire to wear their hair natural for whatever reason or who might have to wear their hair natural for medical reasons. And because we're carrying the stigmas and the burdens of misconceptions about natural hair care that are related to intelligence, because I've got some stories about when I wore my hair natural at work and people didn't realize it was me. So they automatically assume something about me that wasn't true. Um, stepping into rooms and people thinking that you're not smart just because you're, the hair that grows out of your hair naturally is kinky and curly or, and it's not in a slick bun or in a silk press or in a, in a weave. And so I endured that burden essentially so that other people don't have to or if they're in it, I can normalize the struggles that they're having and then show them a way out or a way around it in a way where you can love your hair you can do intentional work to properly care for your hair. You can make your natural experience easy and you can tear down this barrier of appearance and hair care that is preventing you from being your best whole self. And so the underlying passion of helping people to be healthy and whole was the same. It was when I struggled through this process and then I realized how much it was keeping me from being able to show up myself and be my best and feel confident doing it, I decided that something needed to be done. And I realized what was missing or what I thought was needed. And then I created that thing. And now I'm out here trying to help everyone else overcome this significant hurdle to success. Yeah. Yeah. That So that kind of reiterates something that I always teach with whoever I work with. And something I'm super big on is finding your why. Um, and I always say, you know, your why usually doesn't change. Um, it's based out of 
who God uniquely created you to be, uh, your experiences, your environments, it created you into this person. And that's not changing. Um, so it sounded like your why was to help people be healthy and whole. Now, the vision, even though it doesn't change often, it can change. Um, and that could be something that can shift when you have a life changing experience, right? Um, and then the mission. So I always say why vision and mission. The mission can change any day of the week, honestly, because it's just mm-hmm. the plan of how you try to get to the vision, right? And then the purpose behind it is the why. So I think that's a perfect, you know, like case study right here that you see on the show. So I want to ask you this. If you were 21, you don't have to be 21. I'm just trying to make a scenario. <laughs> You're 21, no money, no name recognition, no network. How would you build your vision from the ground up, step by step? And I told you earlier that this question was funny right. because essentially that is what I did. Minimal name recognition. I was divorced and without a job so for the most part. So no money and no network. And so this is what I did. And I would do a few things differently. But when I was thinking about this question, I looked at, I did the things that I said I was going to do. I would just do a couple of things different. So one, I would dream big, very big. And I would have an idea of what I wanted to do so big that it would scare me. And so I think, check, I have done that. One thing that I did not do is protect my dream and my vision a little bit better or a little bit more. When you create something, you're excited about it, but you also have to be discerning about who you share that vision with because some people, as well-meaning as they are, won't be as supportive for that vision, especially if they feel that that vision in my situation was stepping away from that sure thing or that thing that was planned out. So they can't see the infinite possibility. And so they will encourage you to split your time and attention or to abandon that vision at all. So I would dream big. I would protect that big vision and that dream. I would nurture it. I would discover what I needed to do to make that big dream a reality. And I would realize that I'm not by myself. So I would identify the who's that would be necessary in that journey to help me get to where I wanted to be. And I would have, I did invest in myself once I identified what I needed, but I did not lean into those initial communities the way I I should have. So I would say, when you invest in yourself, go all in on those investments. When you say go all in, do you mean like effort? Effort, connection, speaking up. Like I had been very much used to entering a room and absorbing information, but not making any meaningful connections. And this second time around, when I entered spaces and places, I made it my mission to speak up and to use my voice, not necessarily to make myself visible, but to ensure that I was making the most of the investment that I made in myself. And so that is what I meant when I said that, because I entered the room, I got the information, but I never connected with anybody. I don't think I could name three people in the group that I was in. I'm actually kind of still in it, but in the group that I was in. And so this time around, I'm being intentional about making those connections, about building an ecosystem of support with people that also have a vision that don't necessarily have to share my vision, but are dedicated and committed to growth. And I think that's important, especially when you're an entrepreneur and especially if you are a solopreneur, because the moms, the dads, the cousins, the sisters, the girlfriends, the best friends, the boyfriends, they love you, they support you. They think that's a good idea. But when they see you struggling, their automatic suggestion is, oh, go get a job. Or their automatic suggestion is, oh, I mean, you were making six figures two years ago. Why don't you just go do that? And so sometimes you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And sometimes you might need to find something to do to make some money. But you also have to keep in mind that you had this vision, this dream, this idea for a reason. And you can't abandon it just because it gets hard. Everything else from like a strategic standpoint, I would leave the same. I took a big old leap. (laughs) And after like two years in business, 
I decided to open a brick and mortar store. I don't think I would change any of that. I am still learning and growing through that process. But the only thing I wish I would have done was probably done it sooner. Yeah. What would you say to the person that is struggling right now and they're trying to protect the vision? What would you do if you were them? They're struggling to protect the vision or they're just struggling? Oh, they're just struggling straight out. (laughs) (laughs) I would say that is why understanding your why and locking into the passion that got you to the place that you wanted to create this business is so important. Now, this is what I'll say. It's going to be, I don't know who made people think that being an entrepreneur, starting a business was like glamorous or easy. It absolutely is not. It is dirty. It is hard. It is exhausting, but it is still worth it when you understand what you are doing. If you're trying to just make money quick, this is not the thing for you. There's actually no quick money out there, at least not safe, legal, or appropriate for most of us to be doing. So I would say leave the quick money mindset behind and focus on long money. In the interim, if you need to get a job and switch your time, I'm not telling anybody to quit their job. If you got benefits, if you got insurance, if you have health care, figure out how to make it work. I tried to make it work. It just wasn't giving what it needed to give. But figure out how to make it work. Create a schedule that gives you time to rest and to enjoy what you're doing. And then if you have to get a side job or create a side means of income, then do that. Or if you aren't ready to jump away from your stable thing, then don't do that either. I mean, like you don't have to be a struggling business owner if you don't have to be a struggling business owner. So definitely consider all of your options first. But I would say if you have a heart to serve, you completely understand your why, then this hard thing will be hard, but it will be worth it. If that makes sense. So don't Feel how you feel. Be upset. Be angry. Be sad. Cry. Threaten to go get a job. If that's where you're at, do all of that. But then brush yourself off and get back to work. And when you are consistent, when you are committed, we are driven by that why, you'll get there. I'm getting there. It ain't pretty. It's not perfect. It's not everything that I imagined. If you build it, they will not come. They absolutely will not. You got to build it and then tell them about it and not be afraid to tell them about it and then keep telling them about it until they memorize your purpose statement, until they memorize what it is that you do, why you do it and who you do it for. And once they memorize it, tell them again and keep telling them. I mean, you can't. nobody else can love your business more than you do. Right. So treat it like you love it like that man that you were so crazy or that girl that you were so crazy about or that car or them shoes or whatever that thing is that you were so in love with that you never gave up on it, treat your business like that as well. So that would be my advice. It gets hard. Get you a group of people that are like-minded that can support you. So when it gets hard, you have somebody that can relate to where you are, relate to what you're going through, relate to what you're doing. Because it's completely different telling people that don't have that building mindset, Mm -hmm. your struggles, Versus telling people that do have that building mindset, your struggles, and they might have some valuable information that'll help you get where you're trying to go. Or they may have some resources that can help you offset some of the struggle, the frustration. And so get the right network around you. Hold fast to that why and keep going. Yeah. It'll work out. Yeah. Then that's why I'm I'm trying so hard to build the community that I'm building because you need you need it like there are going to be times where you just need that extra push behind you to keep going because i talked in the episode maybe about two weeks ago with a young lady that has a fashion line and Mm -hmm. it's called jesus and sneakers and um she was talking we were kind of talking about like you know how she left her job and how it was hard and like she was like why'd i do this like type of thing and um when it comes to this i'm always like i there's no one size fits all. I left my job, you know, a little while ago. And there are times I'm like, man, this maybe could have been easier if I, you know, th-. but also I'm like, well, I don't know if I will even be where I am right now. If I'll be making the decisions that I'm making, if I didn't 
you know, if I wasn't in the scenario that I'm in. So like, you can't really know. The only thing that you can really trust is God, right? right. So, and I, this is the, I'm going to create so much content on this because this is the number one question that I get or the number one challenge that I see amongst my audience, right? Young visionaries is how am I able to discern God's will for my life? How were you able to discern the path that God was creating for you to take and then obey and not question? So I would say one thing that God is certain about Crystal is that she's going to answer questions. <laughs> it is a gift that I have. Probably why I was so good at being a pharmacist because I'm going to absolutely question everything. But I could not and I cannot let this go. And so one thing I say is that for the number of jobs that I applied for, I was only able to get one, one that actually allowed me to keep doing what I needed to do when it came to building my business until it no longer served me. And so I think that God just put the right amount of roadblocks or detour signs in the way that kept pushing me in this direction. And when I tell you the process, and so this is, I promise you, this is not going to be anybody else's process the process for opening my brick and mortar was so easy Mm. it had to be God there was absolutely nothing and so when I'm standing there sometimes I'm like well God where are the people but I'm like it wasn't I can't question the idea because everything that happened from when I connected with or saw my it was a relative of mine when I saw my relative when the place that I took my children to get my hair cut is now the place that houses my brick and mortar like all of this stuff there's no way when I told somebody what my vision was and they said hey I started a business before I don't want you to spend a lot of money we can do this ourselves when I went into this store and we painted the walls and we built the furniture and we laid the floors and like all of the right people showed up to do all of the work that needed to be done and it didn't and my business paid for it (laughs) That ain't crystal. That's not luck. That's not anything but God. And so I can't question the path anymore. This is it. When the things I prayed about, God allows a person to answer those prayers, sometimes verbally, like even to the point where I'm like, God, if you're talking to me, say my name. And then this person says my name. I mean, I asked for it and you did it. It's God. And so... I think one, though, you have to be able to recognize God's voice. So that requires you putting in some time with God so that you know when God is moving, when God is speaking, when God is working on your behalf, you can also more easily discern it because then you know what it looks like when God moves, you know what it sounds like when God speaks, and then you're better able to discern. So you have to have that relationship first, and then you have to have the trust that if you ask God for wisdom, if you ask God for direction, if you ask God to make a way that when the doors open, when the decision has to be made, when the move and action has to be taken, that then that's God and you move forward, that he gave me the the wisdom to make this decision wisely. He gave me the clarity so that I can move forward without having to look backwards or worry about things. And so we have to trust that the things that we asked him for he would give us and then we move in good faith knowing that it's God. Yeah. I think the biggest thing about I've learned with prayer is that prayer provides you spiritual awareness, right? Mm-hmm. Because all those things could have happened, right? All the roadblocks of you getting the job or the ease of opening up your brick and mortar and you could chop it up to like, Oh, you know, the, the, the job market is blah, blah, you know, like whatever you want to do, attribute what's happening to, or, you know, oh, I just got lucky with the business that, or like you just, your spiritual awareness is a high. So you don't realize that these prayers are being answered. That's why I always tell people, bro, write down your prayers, because when you go back, you got a whole case study track record of like all the answer prayers. Cause you forget, we be forget. We got more into our memory loss. Really? Jesus. It's crazy. 
Yeah, that's the biggest thing I've noticed, like with with prayer for me, and then discerning God's will. But I think that's so true, um, and it's not one size fits all. Every person's no. situation is going to be different. The only person that stays the same is God Himself. <laughs> yeah. And then I asked, I was like, God, I don't want to take anything for granted. I do not want to be ungrateful. Help me to see what you are doing. Like, help me to actually realize the prayers answered so that I can give you the appropriate amount of praise and thanks for what you've done. And so that I won't be ungrateful thinking that you haven't showed up when you did show up. I just didn't pay attention to it. Right. And so that has been a constant prayer in this season of my life, because I don't ever want God to think that I'm ungrateful for any of the things that he has done, that he is doing and that he will do. So, yeah, I tried. I'm trying to be very intentional about observing and recognizing. Cool. We're going to do some rapid fire to wrap up here. What are some bad recommendations that you hear in your profession or your expertise from people to make any of your products yourself in your house? Don't do that. There's some really good quality products (laughs) available on the market that have literally everything you want in it. Take the time to seek them out and then invest in those products. Awesome. And I think that could apply to almost every aspect of life. <laughs> Don't make it in your house. There's some resources, okay? Yes. <laughs> in the last five years, what have you become better at saying no to? In the last five years, I have become better to saying no to everything I don't want to do. If I don't want to do it, if it's going to waste my time, if it makes me uncomfortable, I can say no. No. What do you think helped get you to that point? Um, I would say the biggest thing that helped get get me to that point is, well, a couple of things. Probably therapy, being intentional about being more assertive, and then growing my relationship with God. When you know who you are, when you know who you are, it's way easier to turn down things that look appealing but aren't beneficial. And so I think the combination of all of those things got me to this point where it is easier for me to say no to stuff I don't want. Yeah. When you feel overwhelmed or unfocused or have lost focus temporarily, what do you do? So when I feel overwhelmed, one of my favorite things to do, because I'm a Florida girl and the sun is healing, I go outside, put everything down, take a break shut it down and as it had to be for a long time just as long as the sun can hit my face and my skin there is something about that that is very relaxing to me something about that that is very therapeutic so I will shut it down take some deep breaths soak up some sun and then I'm ready to get back at it yeah I really the earth is healing it really is I told you last time we talked I was like that Florida humidity was that thing was like string. It was like, uh. and I don't even notice it, which I think is so funny. My friend was like, "Girl, it's so humid in Florida." I was like, "What are you used to tell like humid?" Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I almost fainted coming off the plane. I was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> um, don't think I love it here. But yeah, um, but getting out in the sun, like having actual like skin contact with the earth, like getting in some fresh air. It's healing. It really is, mentally and physically. Uh, So I think that's a great recommendation. Dr. Crystal, thank you so much for coming on the Build Your Vision podcast. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Crystal. So three key takeaways that I want to share with you before we exit out of this episode. First thing, protect your vision. Not everyone's going to care for your vision the way you do. That's your baby. That's your egg that you have to protect from getting cracked. You got to remember that everyone in your life is of equal value, but not everybody adds equal value to your life. Okay, be careful about who you share your vision with. Get in communities that help edify, sharpen, inspire, motivate your vision, not the other way around, even if those people are really close to you, because usually the closer to you they are, the more they want to protect you from getting hurt and the more they may operate in a state of fear. But we know as visionpreneurs and as children of God, we do not have a spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. So protect your vision. Number two, a part of knowing God's will 
is having spiritual awareness. Pay attention to the things happening in your life in relation to your vision and spend time with God so that you know when he's at work in your life because you know his voice and you know what his hand in your life actually looks like. This has been huge for me. I said that and I've said in actually a few episodes that I write down a lot of my prayers because I forget what I pray for and then things happen and life goes on and then I just continue. But when I go back to that prayer journal, I'm like, oh, my goodness, God has been working in my life. These things I've been praying for have been happening, even if it didn't happen in the time frame that I thought it was going to happen in, even if it didn't happen in the manner or way that I thought it was going to happen in. I have moved through this vision building process only by the grace of God. And I have evidence that that is the case. And when I'm actually praying about it, it peaks up my antennas because I have laid it at the forefront of my consciousness, not just feeling it in my heart, but professing it with my mouth. You can do the exact same thing. I'm not special. I'm not any more connected to God than really you are. You are just one prayer, one experience, one scripture, one encounter from God because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I just want you to take advantage of that because that's the only way that you can move forward with God's will in this vision building process. You have to have that spiritual awareness or what I like to call that I got from my mentor, the sixth sense. There's a whole episode about that. It's called uh, Your Superpower, something like that. It's in the it's in the 90s, the episode. I'm not exactly sure. I'll link it in the show notes after I record this. All right, number three, last thing is find your why. I have talked about this in multiple episodes, multiple, multiple episodes. I will link that in the show notes as well. But look, your why is your north star. Things are going to get hard. Things are going to get challenging. Things are going to get confusing sometimes. But if you have that foundation in your why, that north star that you can look to, no matter how discombobulated you get, you can find it. You can stay focused. You can stay consistent in this journey. That is the key. That's why I encourage it so much. That's why I've done a whole course on it. Right. And I want you to take advantage of that course. So right now I'm just going to tell you, go to buildyourvisionpodcast.com forward slash why you could take my free find your why course that's buildyourvisionpodcast.com forward slash why the link will be in the show notes i really encourage you to do this and i'm going to list those podcast episodes that talk about this in the show notes as well so that's my three takeaways guys protect your vision try to increase your spiritual awareness through prayer so you know god's will and find your why hey if you love dr crystal on this episode i encourage you to go check her out at www boldculture.com that's b-o-l-d-k-u-l-t-u-r-e boldculture with the k dot com until next time keep building your vision every single day peace executive production by Cleavon Davis music production by Cleavon Davis and Christian Hernandez Build Your Vision Podcast is a product of Build Your Vision LLC. Hey guys, Clee here. Thanks so much for listening to the Build Your Vision Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I would think you did if you stayed all the way to the end. The best thing that you could do to help support this show is by sharing it with somebody. By you just taking a few seconds to recommend this show to somebody, you are making a huge impact, not only on the success of this show, but possibly on that person's life.